Find your Bibles now or your smart device and turn with me this morning to 2 Kings chapter 6. That's where we're going to begin. Years ago, Linda and I lived in New Jersey. Um, we were in different life. It's before we came into the ministry. And Linda's grandmother, whose name is Mabel, came up to visit us. It was a once-in-a-lifetime experience for her. While she was there, of course, she wanted to see all the sights. We lived right across the river from uh, Manhattan. So, you know, we took her to see the Statue of Liberty and the Verrazano Narrows Bridge. We took her into Manhattan and ate some uh, really ridiculously expensive restaurants. We took her to some plays there on Broadway. But she wanted to see the World Trade Center. Now, that's when the, the Twin Towers were still standing. So we took her and, you know, got the car parked, got into the lobby. We took the express elevator up to the top floor. The express elevator, your ears pop on the way up. Now, the observation deck up at the top of the World Trade Centers was just an open floor with windows all around, a beautiful view of everything. You know, to the, to the west, you could see New Jersey and the river. To the south, you could see Staten Island, the Verrazano Narrows Bridge. Uh, to the east, of course, you could see the Atlantic Ocean. To the north, you could see the rest of Manhattan Island. So it was a beautiful, beautiful place to be. So the elevator doors opened, and Mabel marched off the elevator and headed out of the elevator lobby there to the, uh, the windows. And as soon as she caught a glimpse of how high we were, she stopped in her tracks, dropped her head, covered her face with her hands, and stood there as stiff as a statue. And I went over and put my arm around her and tried to convince her everything was okay, and she just would hear no part of it. So I turned her around as best I could and took her back to a little hamburger stand there on that top floor and faced the wall, and she sat there while the rest of us enjoyed the observation deck of the Twin Towers. Fear can paralyze us. That's the effect fear can have on us. Fear will stop us in our tracks. Fear paralyzes. What are you afraid of today? What has you paralyzed? What has you stopped in your tracks? Is fear having that effect on you? Could very well be having that kind of effect on you. We're spending uh, several weeks letting the Bible speak to us about navigating tough times. And we're certainly going through tough times right now, aren't we? The coronavirus. That's why I'm speaking to an empty sanctuary this morning. Something like we've never, ever seen before. And then there's the protesting and the rioting. Uh, there's the anarchy. Even talk of defunding law enforcement. And then there's the polarization of the political parties, each built on different worldviews that can find no common ground. All of that has the world absolutely paralyzed. And as members of our nation, we're paralyzed along with it. But I expect there may be other things affecting your fear factor. And that's the normal things of life. Health issues, financial issues, family issues. All these things exist and just grip us. Just stop us. And I'm speaking today because I think that's probably what some of you are going through also. Today, we're going to talk about fear or having no fear. Really, we're going to focus on going through uh, looking at God's provisions and protection as we're experiencing fear. If we were more aware of God's protections, we wouldn't be so afraid. If we were more aware of what God does and God's doing today to protect us, I know we wouldn't be as afraid as we are. For example, there is near rational fear of white vans that's gripping the East Coast on top of all the rest of this. A fear of white vans. 
Mayor Jack Young said this. He's the mayor of Baltimore. He said this in a TV interview. Don't park near white vans and make sure you keep your cell phone in your hands in case somebody tries to abduct you. And when somebody asked him for his source, <laughs> Young admitted that his information had not come from a credible source. He said this information was all over Facebook. Facebook was his source. My, my, my. Baltimore Police Department says similar unsubstantiated claims have sparked widespread fear of white vans up and down the East Coast. This phobia has spread as far south as Newman, Georgia. Police there have made this plea, and I quote, if you do see a white van or someone acting suspiciously, do not post it on Facebook. Call the police. Call the police. My point is, fear takes on its own life in our world. It does grip us. It does paralyze us. It animates us. It sends us to places we don't want to be. People, what are you afraid of this morning? What kind of effect is fear having on your life this morning? I want us to think this morning about God's protections of these fears, all the fears, all the sources of fears that we have in our world today. We need to recognize God protects us. Here are some of the things I want us to look at this morning as we think about God's protection. God's angels will protect us. 2 Kings chapter 6, beginning in verse 15. When the servant of the man of God, that's Elisha, when the servant of Elisha got up early and went out, he discovered an army with horses and chariots surrounding the city, an enemy army, a huge enemy army was surrounding the city. So he asked Elisha, oh, my master, what are we to do? Elisha said, don't be afraid. For those who are with us outnumber those who are with them. Then Elisha prayed, Lord, please open his eyes and let him see. So the Lord opened the servant's eyes. He looked, this is the servant, he looked and saw that the mountain was covered with horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. So with his human eyes, he sees that which strikes fear into his soul. But with his spiritual eyes, now God has opened those spiritual eyes and allows him to see this massive mountain covered with angels and chariots of fire. God's protection coming to him from angels. Who were these warriors in chariots? God's angels. God's angels is who they were. That kind of conflicts, by the way, that image of God's angels, of, of warriors, that kind of conflicts with traditional understanding of angels that we have, kind of the fairy tale understanding of angels that we have. Let's take a moment and establish some scriptural truths about angels. Now, as I've already indicated, we kind of have a fairy tale image of angels, and that's okay. We have fairy tale understandings of many things, but we need to look at the reality of angels here for just a moment. First, angels do not have halos. There's no such thing as halos. Halos aren't mentioned in Scripture. Halos aren't written by church fathers. There's no such thing as halos in the Bible. Second, angels do not have wings. A couple of passages describe Jesus ascending to heaven without the aid of wings, and angels don't need wings either. Third, angels cannot be seen. It's clear from our passage the servant of Elisha couldn't see the angels until God opened his eyes and allowed him to see those angels. So if we don't see angels, that doesn't mean they're not there. 
just means God has not opened our eyes yet to see them. Fourth, angels always appear as men. In Scripture, angels never appear as fair-haired women, young women. Angels never appear, appear as little babies with six-inch wings. That's fairy tale, sweet fairy tale, but it's not biblical. I saw a painting for sale online that I really liked. It pictured a small child asleep in his bed, and behind the bed there stood an angel guarding the child. But the angel is not a beautiful young woman in flowing white gown, and the angel is not a small child with small wings. The angel guarding the child was a tall, well-built young man holding a shield in one hand and a spear in the other, looking like he knew how to handle both of them. Now that is the vision of angels that were given in Scripture. That's the kind of angel God accesses to give us protection. One other thing, angels carry out God's will. That can be something as gentle as delivering a message or something as formidable as destroying a mighty army. God says in Isaiah 37, 35, I will defend this city and rescue it because of me and because of my servant David. Then the angel of the Lord went out and struck down 185,000 of the camp of the Assyrians. So when it comes to God's angels protecting us, let's understand this. Psalm 34, verse 7, the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and rescues them. God's angels surround those of us who fear him and those angels protect us. That's what the Bible says. Psalm 91, verses 10 and 11. No harm will come to you. No plague will come near your tent. For he will give his angels orders concerning you to protect you in all your ways. One night while John Patton was a missionary in New Hebrides Islands, his station was surrounded by hostile natives. They were determined to kill him and to kill his family. He was just a young man with a young family. So he got his family together, and they got on their knees, and they prayed. Mom and dad, little children, they prayed all night long for deliverance from these hostile natives. When they got up in the morning, these hostile natives were gone. As day broke, he saw that they had left. A year later, the chief of that tribe got saved. Patton asked him why he didn't attack and kill them and his family that long time ago on that night. And the chief was surprised and said, because of all those men with you. What men? I'm reading right out of his book. What men? Patton asked. The chief replied, we were afraid to attack because the camp was encircled with hundreds of big men in shining garments with their swords drawn. Now, this is not Elijah with his servant thousands of years ago. This is one of our missionaries with his family. Same kind of thing happened, though. Something we need to remember while we navigate these tough times God protects those who fear him. He surrounds them with his angels, and his angels protect us. Now, as his church, we need to remember this. Things have gone really frightening out there. Things have gone upside down. Oh, my goodness, what's going to happen? What are we going to do? I'll tell you what we're going to do. God's going to send his angels, his warrior angels, and they're going to protect us. They're going to protect us as a church. They're going to protect us as Christ's 
worldwide church, and they're going to protect you and your family. Let's remember this and not be afraid. We're going to be okay. Here's another thing, talking about reasons not to be afraid. God's Spirit will protect us. Now listen to this. This is the New Testament. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, Peter says, Be sober, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, that's Satan, is prowling around like a roaring lion looking for anyone he can devour. You know, when we think about dangers in this life, this is one that we often overlook, isn't it? We need protection from Satan. I have a file, it's getting older and older now, of 9-11. And one of, the, uh, one of the things that's in that file is a photograph that was taken of the Twin Towers as the smoke was billowing out of them. And the thing that's interesting about this photo is as the smoke is rolling out of those Twin Towers, there in the smoke, there's this unmistakable face of Satan. I mean, it has a chin, a mouth, and a nose, and two eyes, and two horns. That's why it wound up in the newspaper. It frightened just about everybody. That's an Associated Press photo. People accuse the Associated Press of manipulating the photo. But their photo editor, Vin Albacio, issued a statement assuring the public that the photo had not been touched up. He got defensive. He said, we were all just seeing natural indentations in the smoke and our imaginations were jumping to wild conclusions. Listen to this. There is no such thing as Satan. He scoffed. <laughs> oh, yes, there is. Mr. Iblesio. Oh, yes, there is. That may not have been his face in the smoke. That may be a true statement. But I'm guessing Satan was involved in that event at several levels. Much closer to home, Satan and his falling angel, fallen angels are most certainly involved in all our lives. They're constantly at work trying to lead us into dangerous situations. And they're constantly at work setting traps for us, causing us to wound ourselves and those around us that we love. We need protection from Satan and his troops. We absolutely do. 1 John chapter 4, verse 4. You're from God, little children. The one who is in you, talking about the Holy Spirit, the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world, talking about Satan. The Holy Spirit in you is greater than Satan, we're told. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. God has not given us a spirit of fear, talking again about the Holy Spirit, one of power, a powerful Holy Spirit. You know, don't you think it's interesting that when teaching us to pray, one of the things Jesus felt important enough to include in his model prayer, pray like this, Disciples, pray like this, followers. Deliver us from the evil one. Jesus is teaching them and us, you need protection from Satan and you need to ask for it. What an amazing thing. What an amazing thing. The thing we need to grasp today is the Holy Spirit is our protection from Satan. That's why James tells us this in James chapter 4, verse 7. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So as we think about being afraid, as we think about fears, we think about all the things going on in the world today, God's angels will protect us. God's Spirit will protect us from Satan. Reasons not to be afraid. Here's the third one. 
God's presence will protect us. The Milton Freewater Valley Herald printed the following retaction in their paper, and I quote, the title of a first Christian church program in last week's paper should have been recorded as Our God Reigns. It was inaccurately recorded as Our God Resigns. <laughs> yeah, I remember those old bulletins. When it comes to protecting us, God never resigns. He never resigns. He never has. He never will. And he has not resigned today, contrary to everything that's going on. You may be thinking God has abandoned us, but, oh, friend, you need to know he has not resigned. God has not resigned. God is our Savior. Listen to this, Isaiah chapter 43, beginning in verse 1. Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. I will be with you when you pass through the waters. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not overwhelm you. You will not be scorched when you walk through the fire, and the flame will not burn you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, and your Savior. God is our Savior. Today, he's our Savior. I sure like the sound of that, don't you? I sure like the sound of that. God's our Savior. If you were all sitting here in front of me, I would have you repeat that with me, but I don't think you will sitting there on your, on your sofa. God is our Savior. You remember seeing the videos from 9-11? I told you I had a file about this, full of this. And by the way, has it occurred to you the kiddos graduating from high school this year were born after that? They have no personal memory of 9-11. To them, 9-11 is history. It's history. I guess I'm speaking primarily to those of you who are greater than 20 years old. But in this file, what a terrible day. Do you remember watching the videos of the people fleeing those towers, how terrified they looked? Do you remember that? You know, just a few hours earlier, these were strong, competent professionals these were people who were highly educated, highly committed. They went to work that day with important tasks to complete. And yet here they were running from those towers with nothing but fear and anxiety in their eyes. You remember that? Wiping the smoke away, so afraid of those towers, running for their lives. Listen to this. This is the reverse of that scene. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 10. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it, to it, and are protected. God himself is our protection. God is our safe tower. Look, you're not adrift on the sea like a rowboat on the Pacific with no oar. That's not who you are, you and your family. You're not adrift in a large ocean with no one watching you and no one paying attention to your situation, that's not who you are. Can you remember this this morning? God's always with you. God's with you now. God will always be with you. Psalm 125, verse 2. Jerusalem, the mountains surround her, and the Lord surrounds his people both now and forever. That's the group we're in. Psalm 91, verse 4. He will cover you with his feathers. You will take refuge under his wings. His faithfulness will be a protective shield. Psalm 23, verse 4. Even though I go through the darkest valley, I fear no danger, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Do you know what the shepherd uses his staff for? It has two ends. It has the club end that he clubs the enemy with. It has the club end that he protects his sheep and his lambs from. He protects his flock with that club end. But the other end has a hook. And with that hook, 
He draws his wounded sheep to him so he can minister to them. He draws his frightened sheep to him so he can talk to them and quiet them. God's rod and his staff, he's our shepherd. He protects us from our enemies. And he draws us to him to heal our wounds and to comfort our fears. That's the way. You know, here's the thing. That's the way God still is today. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Whatever we read in Scripture about how God was, that's still the way he is today. You're still his sheep. You're still his lamb. He's still there for you. He's still there for you. This world is a dangerous place. And we're in danger from wicked men. From dangerous plagues. We're in danger from painful circumstances. We're even in danger from satanic attacks, we're told in Scripture. Let's have no fear. Because we're protected by God. The global church is protected by God, his bride. First Baptist Church, Pflugerville, is protected by God, our shepherd. But friend, what I want you to remember today is you are protected by God, and you need not fear. Let me close with this. How often in the conflict when pressed by the foes, I have fled to my refuge and cried out all my woes. How often when trials like sea billows roll have I hidden in you, O rock of my soul. And now this new danger when asked what I'll do, O rock of ages, I'm hiding in you. I'm hiding in you. You hide in him too. Pray with me. Lord and Savior, I guess we've become so accustomed to depending upon ourselves and being our own wit and our own wisdom. We live in a culture that encourages making our own plans and establishing our own protection and taking care of our own selves and our family. That even the best among us even the strongest followers among us, we forget that we're not in control. We're not in charge. When it comes to protection from the coronavirus, we're not in charge of that. When it comes to being overwhelmed, even here locally, by the protests and the riots, what's going to happen with all that? We're not in charge of that. When anarchy threatens to undo 240 years of history, we're not in charge of that. When we see our nation that we love so much being divided by a worldview that is foreign to us, we're not in charge of that. You are. What you've asked us to do is to pray and trust. We're praying, and we're trusting, and we're resting in your protection. Great rock of ages, we're trusting in you. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.